Hello everyone, this is Eva Nolik smith with Yoga You Online and I am very happy to be here today with author and yoga teacher Linda Sparrow. Linda has a decade-long background as a yoga teacher and writer. She was managing editor of Yoga Journal for numerous years and she is the author of many many books on yoga including the woman's book of yoga and health a long time guide a, a lifelong guide to wellness which she co-wrote with patricia walden a long-term yoga teacher herself linda co-teaches the courageous women fearless living uh, retreat for women touched by cancer which she considers to be her heart's work she also leads workshops for yoga teachers on how to teach women who may be facing any number of challenges from body issues to anxiety and depression. Linda, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. So fun to be here. Thanks for having me. So first of all, tell us about yourself. How did you get into yoga and how did you end up as managing editor of Yoga Journal? <laughs> <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> I started, um, started getting into to some aspects of yoga when I was in college. Um, I was, you know, I went to college when um, I was less than skillful about being a real person. So I had my challenges of, you know, growing up in the late 60s, early 70s, where, right, so, and on the beach of Santa Barbara. So it was really hard to be me in a lot of ways. And um, I found my way to transcendental meditation, which honestly, so mantra meditation honestly was the thing pretty much that saved my life. Um, and around that same time, I had bounced around for, I had probably had like three or four different majors in college in two years. And I finally met a man by the name of Raimundo Panikar, who is this beautiful East meets West blend. His mom was a, a former Catholic nun from Spain and his father was a former Brahmin priest from India. So he, he just saw in me this little sort of skinny flower child. Um, I think he saw more potential in me than I actually had. And, he would take me on walks around Mission Santa Barbara and just chant in Sanskrit and tell me tales of um, from the Mahabharata and, and talk about the Gita. And I was just mesmerized. He was so kind. And, and all of this made such beautiful sense that I wanted to learn Sanskrit. So I ended up finishing up my undergraduate. And then um, I spent some years in... Um, University of Chicago, um, where Wendy O'Flaherty, who is now Wendy Doniger, uh, was a professor of, of Hindu studies. And she moved to Berkeley, and I was able to do my graduate work. I was there, uh, which was like going home for me. So, you know, that was my background. And I didn't know anything so much about the physical postures, except that Maharishi had a green booklet. Do you remember this, Eva? It was like 12 yoga poses right, that we right. was to do, yeah. and I thought they were really dumb. <laughs> so you can really get it, you know? And then in 1991, 1991, 1992, I applied um, to be managing editor of Yoga Journal, and I was living on the East Coast back then. I saw so somebody sent me a little tiny ad that they had put in the New York Times because all these people wanted us to move back to California where we were from. So I remember knowing the publisher. I remember meeting him somewhere. So I called him up and I said, I'm interested in doing this. And, you know, I have a background in Sanskrit and yoga and I can at least translate yoga poses, right? And <laughs> by then I had been working in magazines and so I said, I really want to do this. And he said, oh, we already picked somebody that we want. We're about ready to offer this guy a job. But if you want to send some stuff out to us to look at, we'll wait a couple of days. So I said, okay. So I did. And anyway, they ended up hiring me. And wow. <laughs> I was really lucky. And I loved it. I mean, it was, it was really great, great fun. And um, I was there for several years, and then I got the opportunity 
to write the women's book. Um, well, I ghost wrote a, a yoga book for Yoga Journal when they were first getting into book publishing. It was it was pretty short lived book publishing um, career for them, but it was called Yoga Basics. And so I I wrote that with a yoga teacher down in San Diego, and the publisher really liked liked it and liked working with me. So they said, "What do you want to do?" And I said, I don't know, I, that, that we talk about yoga in a general sense, and it was so physical, you know, that maybe we should do something about women's health, because there's something really intriguing about the feminization of yoga, you know, and they said, yeah. sure. So, you know, and then in the meantime, I had started taking yoga in earnest, um, physical practice with an Iyengar teacher who would come twice a week to yoga journal and teach us. And oh my gosh, it was so awful. <laughs> it was so strict and my body wasn't really moving like that. And, um, and then a year go, went by and another teacher came who I just love, I still love her so much. She had Kripalu training and Iyengar training. Oh. And her connection with my body, my body's ability to trust her and was like nothing else I'd ever experienced. And I just fell in love with her and I fell in love with the practice. And I've been doing it ever since. That's so great. It's great. I know. I know. <laughs> it's a little bit of a late bloomer to the physical practice, you know, but um, that's okay. And I still do mantra meditation every day. Um, even though I had a Tibetan teacher who told me that I was getting a little too addicted to the high and, <laughs> and the experiences I had when I was a mantra and I should just use my breath. Yeah, that, 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 that reminds me of my brother who also started Transcendental Meditation after I recommended it to him. And he stopped after three months and I said, why, are you, why did you stop? And he said, well, it made me feel too good. <laughs> I feel like I both need to have the ups and the downs. And I was like, why do you need the downs? <laughs> that is really funny. You are not going to have a lot of downs. You got, you're going to experience with that. <laughs> I can't possibly feel that good. <laughs> that is really it's funny. really bizarre. <laughs> uh, but speaking of downs, one, one of your special interest uh, is yoga for anxiety and depression you you've done a lot of work on yoga for women's health and when you do yoga for women's health you also need to talk about yoga for anxiety and depression and i think all of us have those monthly ups and downs particularly around the, our monthly cycle um are women more prone to mood swings in general and if so why is that I think yes, um, and at least that's, that's certainly the perception. I think there are a number of reasons. Um, some people will tell you that women are more susceptible or predisposed to depression and anxiety. Um, I do think it's also the fact that we, it's not so much our hormones per se, that we have like more estrogen and progesterone obviously than men do, it's the fluctuation of them, mm -hmm. particularly around um, postpartum after one has her baby and as we move into menopause, the perimenopause. Right. So it's not so much the plummeting of um, estrogen and progesterone after menopause, but it's that whole fluctuation of up and downs where the body's going, what the hell? What just happened to me? And I don't even know you anymore. You know, there's like a, a real separation in our relationship between our mind and our body that, that really takes its toll. Um, I also think that women think about things way much, way more than men do. So we ruminate and we, we you know, have a tendency to repeat things over and over and kind of figure it out and dwell. Um, so we get a little bit stuck, I think, in our stories. Um, or we suffer from the tyranny of the future, you know? Um, and around that, I think women are more relational. You know, our, our sense of relationships are really important. And when they 
are perceived as being out of balance, I think that can really throw women out of balance themselves. And then lastly, I think that women are more, um, and this is really a generalization, uh, but I think that women are also more apt to want to find out what the hell's going on. So they're more apt to go to a therapist or to a doc or to a naturopath and say, this is how I'm feeling, what's up? Um, right, so, right. Um, so is it actually true that we are, that we suffer more? I'm not sure, but the fact is, is that there's certainly that perception. That yeah, yeah. I think if if I remember right from some statistics you provided, uh, if you look just at the statistics, women are twice as likely to suffer from depression and three times as likely to suffer from anxiety. From anxiety. Yes, that's so. what they say. And and also there's you know I think there's some confusion about or some separation that might not be accurate between depression and anxiety. You know, for women, a lot of times when we'll go through stages of that whole, Patricia Walden talks about this, where there's like so two types of depression. There's that chronic sort of sunken chest, I can't get out of my own way, numbing, numbing down. You know, it's not really even feelings as much as devoid of feelings, mm -hmm. that sense of depression. And then there's that sense of, of anxiety where it's almost like it's your body's way of keeping your feelings at bay and so mm -hmm. we're moving and, and we're worrying about this we're worrying about this and, and we're sort of that anxiety kind of keeps us from sitting down and going ha huh, what's up right. you know and so both of them I think I think it's just a spectrum I think that it's it's not really accurate anymore to say that there's depression and then there's anxiety. I think both of them have a lot to do with an imbalance in our nervous system. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think if you look at the Ayurvedic wisdom, they kind of tend to say there's also different kinds. There's like maybe the Vata deranged depression, which would be more kind of worrisome, um, you know. And I settle, yeah. Yeah, and then the more kapha type depression, which is more the moody, brooding, inward kind of thing. Um, but yeah, this whole theme of depression as imbalance, I feel is is very, very interesting to consider. I mean, certainly modern medicine talks about it in terms of a chemical imbalance. Um, mm -hmm. But there are so many other ways to to look at it. Um, and in the yoga tradition, of course, we talk about um, conditions like this often as physical or energetic blockages and to the flow of, of life force or prana. And we, I think most people are familiar with Amy Weintraub's uh, work in this area because she really was one of the first people who pioneered the applications of yoga for depression, both based on her own experience and then working with many, many people. And she called, you know, as you know, her approach, life force yoga. Um, so it's just an interesting difference in paradigm, like chemical imbalances versus blockages to the life force or prana. Well, you know, and it is interesting because you think right away, if someone has a chemical imbalance, that there must be something she could take yeah. to, you know, that that means that somehow there's something wrong with her body, that an outside something can cure that. Um, right. And what we're saying is it is indeed an imbalance, um, and it is an imbalance. It's more of a koshic, if there's a word, right, imbalance. And and Amy says it, I mean, I think that the way that Amy approaches it is is really right on because oftentimes when people think of prana when we go into a yoga class and we're doing yoga poses one of the real benefits for proper alignment no matter what people are kind of saying these days about the purpose of alignment or the need for it the real benefit of proper alignment for your specific body is to open the channels in order for prana to be able to flow unencumbered, right? right? And so 
So there's not blockages that are in the way if you are sunken in a pose and not open, um, you're not giving space to be able to have that prana flow. Well, I believe this is true in Amy's work too. Um, emotions offer um, or present blockages in the pathways to prana because emotions and sensations, emotional sensations, feelings, move through the body on the wave of the breath. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we're stuck, when we're stuck in any kind of emotion, whether it's this deep depression, whether it's a sense of, of I'll never be, you know, any good, or I am like so anxious I can't ground myself. If we, if we get stuck there, that's a blockage mm -hmm. that is preventing that sensation from moving through and out of our body. Yeah, yeah. And so we need, and that's why, um, and even, you know, physiologically, even from a Western perspective, that's why the breath is so vital. Well, it's obviously vital to our life, lives, but it's so vital to our healing is to be able to extend and control our breathing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I, I think, um, you know, a lot of people pro have experienced, they may not be like, you know, clinical depression, but just feeling kind of down or worried, overshadowed, overwhelmed, and then going into a yoga class and in a sense, hitting the reset button, right? Coming out and things look different and you approach things differently and you tackle your challenges differently. Um, so there's the breath component, but even just a physical practice has that uh, cap capacity to somehow or other shift things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And all, you know, exercise does that. Right. It really does. You know, I mean, yes. people who are runners will say, you know what, I feel awful. I can't get out of my own way. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm going to go for a run. Right. They go for a run. That would not be me, P.S., but, you know, you go for a run, right. and you feel great. Yeah. You think, oh, reset button, okay? Yeah. The difference for me between that and yoga is that, for me, yoga, the physical aspects of yoga really, really does do that. I go into a class, and I guess stop that for a minute. There are reasons why we can feel down. There are reasons why our moods move up and down because life moves up and down. Our experiences move up and down. So there are reasons why I'll feel disappointed, I'll feel sad, I'll feel anxious, I'll feel scared mm -hmm. because life is presenting those things right. to me. Right. And so that's completely natural. And I go into a yoga class and I'm feeling like I had the worst day of my whole life. I get into my body. I feel my feet. I get out of my head and into the physical sensations of the moment. And I feel better. And then as I move into um, quieter poses, I can feel my breath moving. I can feel, you know, I can feel my mind returning to where she belongs right, into right. the body, right? And so that's a lovely thing. And yoga, in my mind, keeps that going longer because in my mind, yoga does something that pure exercise doesn't do, and that is that it brings me into relationship with my body. And so I am way more apt to see what's happening before it escalates into something that I can't control mm. you know so as I learn as I begin to befriend myself I learn the signals of what to pay attention to and I learn the tools of maybe softening that and so each time I may meet it a little bit differently and mm. I think it's huge, you know, and earlier in our conversation before we started to tape, we were talking about 
the benefits of practice, the benefits of yoga, and all the cool studies that are out right now, which is pretty awesome. You know, the idea of, I mean, the, the vagus nerve now is the darling of, you know, physiology, right? Everyone's talking about the vagus the vagus nerve but and right. that's right and that's cool. <laughs> yes you know that new study just showed what we already knew that because the vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic nerve system of course yoga makes it you know helps tone it right. and stimulate it because and studies are showing that and i think that's awesome um and at the same time yoga is showing us how we can through conscious breathing, through the meditative aspect of yoga, which we cannot divorce from the physical practice. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not divorceable. So in order, so our physical practice has that element of breath that helps stimulate the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, in reading about that and reading about the studies, I stumbled on this definition of the parasympathetic nervous system that just kind of does it for me. And instead of calling it the rest and digest, which is, you know, separate or, or opposite of the fight, flight, freeze of the sympathetic, the rest and digest has been we defined as tend and befriend. I just think that's the most, I just think that's so awesome because that to me defines what yoga does for us and the reason that yoga is so powerful. And it's not that I think yoga is only beneficial from the, for the, those times in our lives where we feel kind of blue. Mm -hmm. I think because of its power and its ability to change our physiology, that it is actually really, really helpful for chronic depression. And that's what we're seeing in that, that Streeter study at Boston University School of Medicine. They were talking to people who had been medicated, some of them had been on antidepressants for chronic depression. And yoga was hugely instrumental in um, evening out their moods. So, for us to, you know, to say that it's nice when we're feeling a little off, of course it is. But it's also really a beautiful, I mean, it's a huge part of our toolkit. Right, right. And, of course, if we feel suicidal tendencies, if we get into that profound depth of despair, you know, of course we want help. We never want to think that our practice is going to be the answer to all of our problems. Right, but, right. It's a very, very strong, very powerful um, tool in that toolkit. Yeah, yeah. It's it, and you, it, your reference to the vagus nerve and the sympathetic versus parasympathetic functioning is so apt because I think a lot of us are kind of stuck in sympathetic overdrive and don't really know. And you know, we kind of burn ourselves out and get fried and get adrenal burnout and it sort of oh, yeah. sets us up for you know the same kind of feeling overwhelmed feeling um just not able to cope with life and you know in many cases it's as much a functioning of how well we have tendered to our nervous system or rather how well we have not tendered to our nervous system <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. And, you know, I think the other thing that yoga, uh, the reason that yoga interests me for mood balancing is because, well, I think one way to think about it is that we have to redefine what a yoga practice is. And so in order for us to really use the gifts that yoga presents us, we have to, we have to really think about what that means to practice. And what that means to practice is not trying to find time, which is going to make us more anxious and depressed, trying to find 90 minutes every day or three times a week or four times a week to go to a yoga class because it's not going to happen. And it's really hard um, for a lot of women to show up for themselves when they feel like hell. 
you know, when they feel disconnected from themselves. Um, and so yoga, so home practice is a way for us to integrate whatever it is that we're learning on the mat, maybe in community. And community is very important when we we have mood imbalances. You know, that connection uh, with one another is very, very important. We breathe mm -hmm. together, move together. Um, but then we take that off the mat. We're moving through our lives. We come, you know, face to face with something that we can't deal with. Yoga gives us those, you know, five second um, practices. You know, we come home and we integrate what it is that we, we heard or we learned or that a teacher showed us and we play with it in our own body and we realize, you know what? When I'm feeling such and such, this is something I can use. Right, right, yeah. You know, this is something when I am faced with a difficult conversation. Isn't that interesting that when I am in pigeon pose, for example, and I'm really in discomfort, isn't it interesting that I pull away and I can see that I don't like being uncomfortable. And then when I'm in an uncomfortable situation, I can realize that I was in that pigeon pose. I didn't fall apart. I didn't dissolve. I stayed there and for, for 10 breaths and I was, I was fine. So I can be in this uncomfortable situation for five breaths, maybe 10 breaths, and I know I'm not gonna die. I'm not gonna fall apart. Someone's, you know, I can, I can be okay. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think there's also um, this really significant shift in perception that happens where, you know, you step into class and things look one way and you go out of class and things look very differently. And that happens enough times that you start realizing, oh, you know, ah. this, this is how my mind is interpreting things right now. But yep. my mind is likely going to interpret things differently later on. So yes. you're not so tied to your story. You know, that's really an interesting thing because if you think about the way that, I mean, and the sutras give us all kinds of little practices, you know, like potentially says, cultivate the opposite. You know, if you feel really down, if you feel like, nothing is you know you feel so sad or so whatever what would it feel like to bring up something that gives you a great amount of joy feel that experience it be that mm -hmm. and see if that shifts right, right. you know yeah. um, there there's a, a story of a, a well-known yoga teacher who suffered a lot from ocd and from anxiety um when she was younger and she, I mean, nothing she did worked. And one day in a yoga class, just without, she heard the yoga teacher say to her, just breathe. She, he said it to the class, just take a few minutes and just breathe. And she thought, huh, okay. And she was feeling really, really anxious. So she took a deep breath and nothing happened. She took another deep breath. About the sixth time she thought, I just felt a shift. In my anxiety, I feel a little calmer. And by the end of class, she was able to walk out of class feeling really calm. And she said she experienced something she hadn't experienced in a long time, and that was happiness. <laughs> and so, just, I know. So, just that lesson in class, she was able to, next time she felt really anxious in her life. What would happen if I just sit here and breathe? Right, right. See what happens. And so that's what yoga does. To, it allows us to take those little teachings and move them into practice. Mm -hmm. The other thing that yoga does that I think is hugely important for women, that is that it teaches us to be patient and it teaches us to be generous with ourselves. I think for those of us who suffer from mood swings, just being able to be patient and wait and to see what the next breath will bring, see what the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Buddhists talk about the paramitas. And the paramitas, these, 
these six perfections, I guess they call them, um, they start with generosity. They don't start with discipline. They don't start with this, you know, I got to do it. I got to do it right. I, I got to show up. It starts with being generous and then discipline. And discipline is bookended by generosity and patience. And that's wonderful. Yeah. It's so if my practice doesn't give me the results I need, I'll practice again, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, and that's, you know, I think, you know, Eric Schiffman says it over and over and over again, and that is that yoga above all is a practice to allow us to know ourselves. Yeah. And and if we can't find space at the table inside of us for all that we are, all the depression, the anxiety, the fears, the joys, the the connections that we have, if there's not space for all of those, then the ones in the dark will continue to fester and grow and become way more important than they really are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's such a powerful tool for self-care where you you learn to you learn about your mind you learn about your body you learn about the kind of inseparable connection between what's going on in your body and how you feel and then have these many this big range of tools to really modulate that which is just as you and i know and anyone who's practiced for a number of years know just a a tremendous gift to be able to have that knowledge. It really is. It really is. And to have the breath, you know, to have the mind and the body in relationship through the agency of the breath is something that is powerful in every aspect of our lives. Yeah. Because then we know that in our relationship with ourselves, that we have some, <clears throat> some control over how we show up, you know, right. yeah. how we help ourselves be in the world in a way that's healthy. Yeah, yeah. Well, Linda, um, we're also very excited because you do have a course uh, on Yoga You uh, on the topic of yoga for balancing moods. Um, and we have subtitled it A Woman's Guide to Emotional Well-Being. And nice. really your focus is on, on the different applications of yoga for anxiety and depression, not clinical anxiety and depression, because as you rightly noted, you do need to work with a professional for that. Uh, but tell us about the course and what you... I'm, ex I'm excited because I do think that I want to bring a blend of uh, Western and Eastern understanding, because it is exciting what people are finding in the West that we've known all along, kind of, but it is exciting that we're being um, supported that way and validated. And so I love knowing what's happening in my body when I'm feeling all these things. Because, right. you know, all that good information um, is power um, and it's a way of helping us heal if we know what's happening, right? right. Um, but then I really love the poetic way that yoga explains what's happening and not only explains what's happening through the koshas, through the subtle anatomy, but also um, gives us tools that we might not think about um, in our Western context as we, as we move through the world. You know, yeah. um, so that's what I want to play with. And I want to really be able to have people come away with really specific ways of of helping themselves, but also the understanding of how we can tend and befriend, because I think that's really key. So mm -hmm. I'm excited. That's beautiful. That's true. And you worked a lot with cancer patients, right? I do. I Where do. I'm sure that those kind of difficult emotions is part of the package that you have to deal with. Oh, depression, anxiety, and fear. Right. Really, right. really you know, and the way that we present asana and pranayama is not just through 
relaxing and and feeling you know sort of restorative poses i mean we look at it's what it feels like to be in your body what it what does it feel like when you're anxious or depressed to feel your strength you know to feel your determination to feel your ground and to be able to know that you're supported um not just you're supported by the earth you're supported by one another and you know so the sutras um really really help with that it, i've been doing that work for oh gosh a dozen years now yeah. and it it's really pretty remarkable yeah they've taught me a ton <laughs> yes i can only imagine i can only imagine yeah oh, wonderful well linda thank you so much for joining us today we really appreciate it and my pleasure i'm looking forward to our time in may yes we are too very much Take care and enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.